as you as you guys are coming in, it's truly a joy for me to see. Um, just see the buzz as you guys are coming in. Just see the the uh, the talking. It just shows that you had a great discussion, um, and and just the excitement about this lesson is just um, really pleasing. So let's let's open in prayer, and then we'll jump in here. Heavenly Father, uh, what a great night. We thank you for so much of everything. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the Old Testament. We thank you that we get to uh, overview it tonight. We, we, we pray that your applications for us we can take to heart and we can um, be followers of your um, calling on our life. And we just thank you for uh, this opportunity to freely meet and, and to just worship you with, with our discussion tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I got a couple announcements to start. So um, this is a children's volunteer program. Um, if you want to volunteer for the children's program, we have a great children's program start this year. As you know, we combined or co-located with the women, and I believe there's there's... 60 plus kids signed up uh, between the two of the, of the, of the programs. So uh, they're in need of some volunteers. So if somebody is not there, we always want to have two in the room. So if, if uh, you're thinking about, hey, I want to check out what they're teaching the kids, it's a brand new curriculum this year. These are back at the admin desk. So grab one on your way out. And it'd be great if, uh, if you were uh, able to volunteer for the student program. The next thing is, we're looking for a treasurer because the guy on the screen had to move on. So uh, Mike is moving on. So if, if you're uh, interested in, in doing it, um, he was able to do it great and well with, and survived. And so it's, it's, it's not a super easy job, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, and so we're looking for that. So if you, if you have uh, anybody that would like to do that, let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll get you going. Okay. Let's see here. The next one is we got five seminars this year. So BSF always has seminars, and Dan Jackson, our substitute teaching leader, will be leading all five. Um, he calls me a slave driver, but, but that's okay. Um, and so, but he has the privilege of leading these. And the first one is on October 10th. And so if you uh, want to know more about the Bible, uh, just how to... Uh, we were talking earlier about how to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Come to this seminar, and and Dan will take you through that. And the, and then we go to homiletics, sharing the gospel, serving, and leading a small group, all scattered throughout the year. Now these start at 5:45 here in uh, in one of the rooms back there. So uh, if you can come early, uh, it'd be great to have you for these seminars. And we'll give you more information as the time goes. Okay, so I love maps, uh, and this is uh, my, my, my family and I, we live in Minnesota, obviously, and one of our favorite things to do is go to the ocean, and so we get to go to the ocean every couple years, and we typically drive, and if you can see, this is a driving trip, and it, you know, it takes us a couple days, maybe sometimes three, we stop along the way, we uh, we have to get gas, we use the restroom, food, all of that stuff. And what I'm, what I'm contrasting that is, is we've also flown there, and you can see that it's, it's a lot quicker. But when you fly, um, you get a different perspective. Um, you get to see the mountains uh, from, from a different perspective than driving through. They're both beautiful, but it's a, a different way of looking at it. I remember one of my trips was flying to California and just coming in over the mountains, under the clouds, and seeing the ocean, a view you're not going to get from a car. And so the reason I bring this up is tonight we're going to go through the whole Old Testament. So Malachi, or Genesis to Malachi in 25 minutes. All right? Um, let's see how we do. So hopefully your discussions were, were, were good tonight, but, but again, BSF typically on that first lesson they go through the whole lesson, the whole overview. But tonight, instead of just going through divided kingdom, we went through the whole Old Testament. So what can we learn? As we travel through the history of God's chosen people, Israel, we're going to highlight some of the aspects of their part in God's plan. 
Why is studying the Jewish people important? What can we learn from it? What does it matter to me today? As we look at the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, three big themes immediately pop out. Revelation, rebellion, and punishment, and then redemption. We're going to see that over and over. God reveals himself to his people in the Old Testament. And he also uh, redeems his people. We see that in the Old Testament. Have you ever heard someone say, I'm a New Testament Christian? We talked about this a little bit on our leadership meeting. Is uh, Maybe you've heard it, maybe you've said it. Um, but really, the whole Bible has been inspired. And so, just like Hebrews says, we are under the New Covenant. So sometimes we focus on the New Testament because we're under the New Covenant, and we maybe spend less time on the Old Testament. But the privilege we have this year is to really dig deep into the Old Testament. Last week's doctrine was the Bible, and one of my favorite verses is, all scripture is God-breathed and, and useful for teaching, rebuking, uh, correcting, and training in righteousness. We can substitute the Old Testament for that, because that, that is scripture. So the Old Testament is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching me, for rebuking, for correcting, and, and training me. It's also the Old Testament is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the Old Testament is very relevant. One of your questions this week was, uh, Jesus referenced the Old Testament nearly 100 times. So we know it was important to him as well. All scripture is for us to meditate on. So what can we learn from the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament that is applicable to us today? Our doctrine this week is humanity, creation, and purpose. And, and BSF always has a big idea, which is the overarching idea for the week. And this one is Israel's part in God's plan. So we're going to go through that. Have you ever wondered why you were born? Have you ever wondered, why am I here? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? God does have a purpose for all of us. The question is, are you ready to accept it? Let's jump in the divisions and see how that applies to us. So it's tough to break down the, the whole Old Testament in a couple of divisions, but here's where I chose to go. Uh, the first division is Genesis through 1 Samuel 7, where God establishes Israel as his chosen people. And the second division is 1 Samuel 8 to Malachi, where Israel's story reveals God's faithfulness despite human failure. Israel is the main part of the Old Testament. Israel's story does matter to us today, but we have to start from the beginning. Before God chose Israel, Israel, we need a foundation to see why we need a Savior. In Genesis, before creation, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, had a, had a unique love. Uh, God is love. And so that unity between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was there. And God decided that he would create mankind to share that and invite us into that perfect union. When God created Adam and Eve, when he made us in his image, not like the animals, um, we have a soul, we have eternity, uh, we have reason, we don't just do on instinct like animals do. He made mankind perfect and without death. He also created mankind to work. He placed man in the garden to work prior to the fall. We were uniquely designed for fellowship with him. We see from Genesis to Revelation that God wants to be our God. He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. All the way to Revelation, he, he says, I want to be your God. Or I will be your God and you'll be my people. He's a relational God. He gave Adam uh, and Eve wonderful uh, commands, be fruitful and multiply, uh, and by creating a helper for man, and make it, he made that all possible. Have dominion over the animals, rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth. And then he gave them the one rule. Don't eat of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. For in that day you will surely die. And the Hebrew for that is, dying you will die. So they don't, didn't drop dead, lightning didn't strike, but they started the process of dying. But Adam and Eve... Their perfect environment wasn't enough. They wanted to be God. 
When Adam and Eve sinned, they broke fellowship with God, and all humanity fell into sin. All creation, including the earth, came under God's curse. This represents the greatest strategy known to man. In Romans 5, it says that, that um, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and therefore death spread to all men because of Adam's sin. However, we can't blame Adam and Eve and go, boy, they sure messed it up. Because you know what? Every time that we have the opportunity to walk away, sometimes we do, but a lot of times we grab that fruit because we want to. Sin is fun for a time. That's why we do it. And it may get us ahead in this world. It may um, satisfy some desire, but, but every time we do that, we're in the same boat as Adam and Eve. So we can't blame our environment because they had a perfect environment and sinned. We can't blame our parents. We can't blame uh, our, our government. We can't blame our schools, whatever it is. Um, we have to be accountable for that. Now, God calls out Adam for his sin. Um, he he uh, brings curses, pain for the woman, weeds and sweat of your brow for Adam. They're banished from the garden. But he also brings that redemption. When he's, when he's given the, the, the curse to the serpent, he gives us a first hint of that redemption plan. Not a lot of detail, but the first hint. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That's the first promise of a savior. Then God did something really interesting. He killed two animals to provide clothing for them, clothings of skin. I consider that the first blood sacrifice because blood has to be shed for sin. It goes through the Old Testament all the way through. And Jesus had to shed his blood for us as well. Blood has to be shed for sin. It can't just be winked away or swept under the, under the rug. So this promise of a Savior represents our greatest hope and privilege. Now, there were 1,600 years from Adam to Noah. That's a long time. And we don't have a lot of detail what went on there, but we do know what happens closer to when um, Noah was alive. In Genesis 6, 5 to 6, we get a window into God's character and his heart. It says, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness was on the earth and became that had become, and, and every inclination of the, hearts of, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain or regret. It's a picture in a God's heart. Wickedness causes him regret and, and, and pain. There was judgment, for sure. We all know about the, the global flood. But there was also grace, because Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You would think that mankind would learn after the flood. Uh, but we have the Tower of Babel. The pride swelled up. They wanted to build this tower to heaven, and God had to come down and disperse them across the face of the earth with languages, different languages. That's why we, oops, that's why we have so many languages today. We get a picture of God's sovereignty in the book of Job. Satan has to ask for permission to test Job. But here's where we find God allows adversity, doesn't he? He allows things to happen to his people that we don't understand. Um, and sometimes we want to question. But we find out in Job that questioning God is really foolishness. God gives Job 60 questions in Job 38. It says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? God really brings him to test. Say, I am God. And you're my, you're my child, but you're not God. And, and we see Job repents and is beautifully restored. But it's a, it's a window into who God is. He does allow things to happen to us. In Genesis 12, we get the call of Abraham. Leave your country. Leave your country. I'm going to make your name great, and all peoples will be blessed through you. Abraham, Abraham obeyed, didn't he? he? He left. I don't, you know... <laughs> 
If God says, yeah, pack up your bags, Keith, and go where I'm going to show you. I mean, that, that takes some faith to do that. The New Testament explains that Adam believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. There was no works involved. Adam believed when God said that you're going to have a son with Sarah. Now, Adam, or I'm sorry, Abraham um, made some mistakes along the way for sure. But he believed that promise. And God delivered that miracle when Sarah was in her old age, age 90. Abraham was faithful to his calling. Then there was 400 years of slavery. And he said, I'm going to, you're going to come out with great possessions after that 400 years, he told Abraham. So then we see, again, we're going over high level fly, fly over here. We see Moses come on the scene, called by God to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And you know, the great thing is we get to study the life of Moses in one of the BSF studies. But the last time we were through that, what really hit me was, God establishes the Passover in Egypt 1,500 years, basically, before Christ was there to fulfill the ultimate Passover lamb. So God is a God of patience, and he does stuff way before um, um, we could ever imagine. We look a little bit at Moses, and we go, he was a prophet. So in Numbers 12, we get a little insight into Moses and God's relationship. The Lord says, when, I, when a when a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face clearly, not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Moses was so close to God that he said in Exodus 33, Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on who will have mercy, and I will have compassion on who will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. We see that God is holy, and we're not. We don't get to tell God what to do. He is the potter, and we're the clay. In all that, Moses was faithful to his calling. Then we see Joshua. He willingly submitted to Moses. He didn't take the popular view, and, and with the other ten spies, when they went out, he was faithful. And at the end of his life, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was faithful to his calling. Then we get into the judges. Deborah, Gideon, Samson, many others. We see Israel follow for a while, then fall away. Follow for a while, then fall away. Here's another window into God's heart. In Judges 10, 13... This is what God said to Israel. But you have forsaken me and served other gods, so I will no longer save you. Go and cry to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you're in trouble. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of their foreign gods and they served the Lord. And God could bear Israel's mis misery no longer. So he brings deliverance. There's punishment for rebellion, but repentance, turning away from them foreign gods and following God, brings restoration. Isn't our God great? We go on to Ruth. Her husband died. She was faithful to her mother-in-law. Uh, we get on to Samuel. His mother, Hannah, was suffering from infertility. And she dedicated Samuel. If she were to have a son, I'm going to dedicate him. She, was fo she followed through in that faithfulness. Samuel was faithful to God. And this brings us to the end of our first division and our principle. God chooses Israel, which reveals his love and faithfulness. So all through this, God has chosen Israel. God was their king. But now we get into the second division. And this is from, from uh, 1 Samuel 8 to Malachi. Israel's story reveals God's faithfulness despite human failure. What changed from 1 Samuel 7 to 8? You see, the people asked for a king. God was their king. And now they wanted a human king. God said to Samuel, It is not that they have rejected 
me, you, but they have rejected me as their king. Samuel warned them, but the people refused to listen to them. We want, give us a king so we can, that can go fight our battles. God gave them a request. And things started to go poorly. Saul started out strong. But then pride set in, and he fell. So God started over. Remember, Samuel goes to Jesse, show me your sons. Jesse brings all but one of his sons, and Samuel goes, oh, it must be this guy, it must be this guy, it must be this guy. And, and nope, it's not, because man, God looks, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, we learn. We learn more about God. He doesn't care what you look like. He wants to know what's in here. Are you faithful to him when no one's looking? Are you faithful to him in your heart, not what looks on the outside? Now, David was a man after God's own heart. Just look at the Psalms. I was reviewing, I mean, there's many of them, but Psalm 23. I mean, it's one of the most um, favorite Psalms out there. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He gets the glory. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What more do you need? God is there, and we get to dwell in his house forever. But David was also a great sinner. We know. 2 Samuel 11 with Bathsheba. He tries to cover it up, but we can't hide from God. We think we can. Even David thought he could. What happens? God confronts him. You are the man. But then the Lord also said, I'm going to take away your sin. You're not going to die. So there's forgiveness. But there's still consequence. There's always consequence to our sin. For David, the sword would never leave his house. I'm going to take your own wives and give them to one who's close to you in broad daylight. You did it in secret. I'm going to do it in daylight. And the child conceived in adultery will die. These are consequences of sin. When we think about and are tempted, and I used, as, as, a, as a kid, I used to think, wow, I'll just ask for forgiveness tomorrow. That's just wrong thinking because there are true lifelong consequences to sin. So be careful when you're tempted. But through all this, David was faithful to his calling. In your question on the fifth day, it's said to go to 1 Kings 11. And it describes a pretty sad scene. Solomon's fall. He had it all. Riches, wisdom, everything. I, I guess if you want 700 wives, I, I guess that's good, maybe, for him. Um, I'm happy with one. Uh, but it was, it was the foreign wives so that, that got him into trouble. He first disobeyed because he was not to marry foreign wives. And when he did, they, they pulled him away. Uh, I can imagine this didn't happen overnight but probably many years or weeks or months of small compromises. I shared on with the leadership team <clears throat> on Saturday, uh, there's a song by Casting Crowns called Slow Fade. And I shared that, uh, and I just want to share it with you as well. Here's some of the lyrics. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray and thoughts invade, choices made, a price will be paid. When you give yourself away, people never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. Solomon had that slow fade. How are you doing against that? When temptations come your way, maybe the big ones are easy to spot and we can walk away from them. But what about the small ones? Don't let the slow fade happen, whatever that is. 
Solomon's failure gives us the study this year, divided kingdom. That was the, that was the consequence of Solomon's failure. God says in, in, second, in, in 1 Kings 11, he said, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart is turned away. I don't know about you. I never want to be, the Lord became angry with Keith, right? I want to be uh, following him. We're going to see wicked kings. We're going to see a few good kings this year. Uh, we're going to see God rel relentlessly pursuing his people through judgment and redemption. We'll see God use pagan kings to punish his people. We'll see God use prophets to warn his people over and over again. We get to see Isaiah predict how the Son of God is going to die on a cross 700 years before crucifixion was even invented. We get to see Jonah, who runs away from the Lord's call. We see Amos, Hosea, uh, who probably had uh, one of the tougher calls. Be faithful to an adulterous wife. How tough would that be, day in and day out? We eventually get to where the northern kingdom falls uh, and is never restored. The southern kingdom is taken captive into Babylon. God's grace is there with Daniel. Uh, Jeremiah tells the people to settle down and, and prosper in Babylon. We then see Esther come through for such a time as this was her time. The Old Testament is there to teach us how to live. Micah 6 8. Oh, he has shown you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. How are you living this verse out? So, that was a quick flyover. Um, we're getting to our second principle. God's faithfulness to, faithfulness to Israel reveals his redemptive heart toward humanity. Israel was not faithful. And in many ways, we can... We can uh, we're Israel, right? There's so many times that we're not faithful. God created us for a specific purpose. Israel's purpose was to bring his plan of salvation. 4,000 years after Abraham, or about that, what is the purpose that comes for us? Matthew 28, 19 makes it pretty clear, right? Go tell others of the salvation that only Jesus can bring. Each of us have a choice every day to be faithful to our calling. Think of today. How many opportunities, how many people came across your path that you could have swung the, dis the discussion from the natural, talking about the Vikings, not sure how they're doing, right? Talking about football or whatever, swing it to the spiritual. Find out where they are. Every interaction is a potential for us to live out our calling. Do people know you are a Jesus follower at work? Do people know you love Jesus on social media? Are, or are you letting the world's idols seep into your walk with God? Are you submitting to your creator? Or do you still insist on thinking you're in control? Because we're really not in control. We think we are. God chooses you just like he chose Israel to bring glory to himself. Are you willing to let God be God and let your life bring glory and honor to him? Oh, do we have the last slide? No? Okay. BSF's vision is to magnify God and to mature his people. That's what we're called to do as well. As we enter this new study this year, will you trust God to help you maintain focus on the deeper purposes he has for you. Is God calling you to do more? Pray about being receptive to what he has in store for your remaining days on this earth. All of us are going to be standing face to face with God in probably 80 years or less. Some of us closer. What are you going to do with your remaining days? How can you be faithful to his calling? Let's pray. 
Lord God, we, we thank you for uh, this study. We thank you that you are so faithful. When we choose to disobey, when we choose to sin, that, that there is forgiveness and that the punishment that we deserve was put on Christ 2,000 years ago. And we don't deserve any of it, And so, but you freely give it to us. And Lord, we are so thankful for that. Lord, I pray that through this study that you would reveal to us uh, our deeper calling to serve you and that we would be open to let the Old Testament drive us and closer to you and reveal to us how we can be fruitful for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday. Hi, BSF friends. I know you've anxiously been waiting for an update on the show.